I do, I do. <laughs> I do, but you know my sister, Ellie. I do, yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's got a memory like I don't know what I'm trying to do. Yeah, yeah, it's like a I'm the flash. In the flash. In the early 1980s, his was the vision, and he was the driving force behind setting up the Opportunities Unit, the Neighbourhood Services Unit, the Police Monitoring Unit. And when Graham Stringer became leader of the council in 1985, John succeeded Graham as chair of the City Labour Party, which in those days was a very influential position to have. And John used this very rare combination of skills in all his political activity. He was central to the campaign in the late 1980s to challenge Section 28 and in organising the largest demonstration against Section 28 this is the city's ever seen. He was central in persuading the Labour Party nationally to adopt very comprehensive policies on lesbian and gay equality. And I think I just want to give um, an example of what happened when people met John. I remember very vividly uh, one year at the Labour Party conference in Blackpool that in the evening John was at a club and was chatting and dancing with a young gay man who happened to be in the Royal Navy. And at that time being gay and being in the Navy was illegal. So one night this guy met John and was chatting and dancing in the club. The next night he was addressing a PAP meeting of the Labour, the Labour Party conference and sharing the platform with Tony Benn and Ken Livingston. So that's what happened if you met John. Um, for most people, that level of political activity and holding down a full-time job would have been enough. But John was always as interested in his own personal development and growth and the personal development and growth of all of his friends. So as well as doing all this campaigning, we were also in consciousness raising groups, we were co-counselling, we were doing civil mind control, we were meditating and listening to whale music. Um, I think John also struggled with life a lot, actually, and certainly in his early years, he suffered from very deep bouts of depression at times. But I think the reality also is that in spite of this depression, it never stopped him supporting and nurturing an incredibly wide range of friendships. It never stopped him campaigning to change the world. And this passion for politics continued right until the end of his life. The last conversation I had John, with John a few days before he died, when he was in a great deal of pain and slipping in and out of sleep, he was still interested in all the gossip of the, about the Labour group. He was still actually asking me about a close friend of mine who was going through a very difficult time. He still out of the blue said, Paul, how would you solve the, the current crisis in the Eurozone? Now, you might. What's the answer to this? Um, I think we've all lost a friend, but the world, and in particular this city, has lost a man of ideas and intellect, a man of passion and principle, a man who saw very clearly what was wrong in the world and tried to change it. This world, and in particular this city, is a different place, is a better place, because of John's life and work and achievements. It is a poorer, poorer place without him. John was known to a lot of us here as a very good friend, a very good friend indeed, and to others as someone who gained their immense respect for what he did in his political and working life. And I'm sure that no single person could capture all of John Paul has spoken. I also met John first in 1978, so let me just say a few things. John was brought up in Surrey, but he came to uh, Manchester and he spent more than three decades of his life here. He came to the north of England to go to university at Lancaster and then York, and then he came back to Manchester. And with a brief spell in London, 
in the mid 70s, he stayed. He gave a real, a great deal to this city. He created many enduring friendships, amongst gay men certainly, but also from his early life, from politics and campaigns, from public service and from other aspects of his life. John applied a high intelligence and compassion and sheer hard work to public service. He was a skilled community worker, he was an able leader, and he made inspiring contributions to services for some of the poorest and most marginalised people in this society. He worked early in housing and for local authorities, and then he gave his great energies to working for services for children and young people. He worked for Save the Children, but he also freely gave his time to other charities. And for example, he was the chair of the trustees of 42nd Street, the Young People's Organization. John was a powerful public speaker and advocate, but he also wrote very well. He was an original thinker, as well as a professional practitioner and a political and community activist. John worked too hard. Sometimes he exhausted himself, and does, of course. Um, but out of those activities, he made close friends, including friends not only in Manchester, but around the country and around the world, and he sustained those friendships. He had a deep sense of care and gener generosity of spirit for people. Not only his friends, but people he met day to day, a quality that was evident in the very, until the very last weeks of his life. He needed friendships. After the exhilaration of the new gay politics in the 1970s, some of his friends died of AIDS after the early 1980s, and he, with others, had to face that and to overcome it. But for John, this reinforced his will to make the most of his life. And he continued to explore and embrace personal and political changes to meet the times. We mustn't, though, be too solemn about John, because it wasn't all work and politics. There were the parties and the sex, too, and usually all in the same day. And of course, he could be infuriating. How many times did he seem to lead his friends to terrible restaurants, or to country walks in exactly the same place, usually style woods, because actually, of course, he was concerned with the conversation and the food in the landscapes counted for relatively little. In the last couple of years, John uh, was a member of the Green Party, of which I'm the secretary in Manchester. And I say this because a month or two ago, he lamented to me how little the contribution was that he'd been able to make in the short period of his membership. In fact, he'd spent tens of hours, and I'm not exaggerating, sharing ideas, helping to think about what to do, to think about the issues, and giving me sincere personal encouragement and support in what I was trying to do. How absolutely typical of John that he simply did not know what he gave us. I now invite Judy Benson, who will read The Guest House by Rooney. This poem, which is called The Guest House, is about acceptance. It's about being kind to ourselves, however bad we may be feeling. It's dedicated to our dear friend John, who welcomes us all to his guest house and welcome kindness. The Guest House by Rumi. This being human is a guest house. Every morning a new arrival. A joy, a depression, a meanness. Some momentary awareness come 